Hi, Julia Asha Recipes for a Sweet Life. Welcome back. As you may or may not know, I shoot my videos eight at a time, roughly once each quarter. And each time I like to do at least one video that really wows and impresses with a 3D cookie. And I'm hoping this project meets the mark. Today we'll be doing a 3D folk art bird nest cookie project. This piece you see in front of you, it's a 10 cookie project. It's relatively involved. So I've decided to break this video into two pieces. In this video, we'll talk about the making and shaping of all the cookie parts, particularly the more complex domed and contoured scalloped pieces. We'll also talk about how to decorate the more involved decorative aspects of this project, namely the base, which is comprised of four cookie pieces and the bird up top, which has some dimensional royal icing transfers on it. The other pieces, the intermediate domes and things are relatively simply dipped and detailed. I will touch on those, but I do have other videos that cover those types of decorating methods in depth, so I won't belabor them here. In a second video, we'll then take all those decorated pieces and build it from bottom to top. You'll see the assembly. And I've got a third video, which is how to create and shape the fun flowers and leaves that go on the vines. They are beautiful on this project, but not necessarily something that needs to be coupled with this project. They're going to look gorgeous and fun and whimsical, say on cupcakes or cakes as well. So I've created a whole independent video for those. Let's start first with the cookies needed for this project. But before I do that, let me just say that this project was loosely inspired by some artwork I saw in a local gallery here in Webster Groves. That's often where I get my ideas from, real life objects I see in everyday life. And this particular art was done by a fire de bisque artist by the name of Stephanie Barkin. She did this beautiful, whimsical folk art bird cage. And I decided I liked the structure. I wanted to eliminate the bird cage just to simplify it a bit. And then hence a bird's nest was born. I departed a fair bit from her design, but I did want to give her a shout out because that's what originally triggered the thought. So back to those cookies. There are 10. Uh, the first consists of and the biggest is this roughly six inch fluted round that'll form the base of the project. I may state dimensions here in the video, but it's always best to go into the video description and check the exact dimensions where I have everything listed because I sometimes make mistakes here as I talk. Onto that will go a roughly four inch diameter hemisphere with a hole cut in the top. This was shaped over a four inch cake round and I'll show some of those forms and molds in the next little segment. Notice it has a hole through the middle as do most of the pieces because we'll be driving a skewer from top to bottom to keep this from leaning. Oftentimes I like to do away with internal supports, but in this case it builds up at least a foot and I wanted to make sure I could build it relatively quickly without it falling over. I've got this fun and interesting scalloped and contoured piece, which I will talk quite a bit about because it's a unique shape I haven't done before. That's just gonna provide an added decorative detail on top of the dome. Once it gets dipped, it'll be laid on top and decorated. Then there's smaller domes that will be the internal supports, one facing this way. These two will be coupled together and joined like so. And then the smaller one will go on top and then the nest part will sit directly on top of the small dome. All these domes are shaped the same way. I think there are six in the project, so I'll probably show the shaping of just one of them because they're all the same. Here's the nest. It'll get turned this way with a ring cut much the same way this one was, but not contoured to sit on top to finish off that upper edge. And then the 10th cookie is the bird. This is cut with a cutter that looks a little different than this shape. So this is what's called a Franken cookie and cookie vernacular, which is creating a brand new shape out of an existing shape by cutting a piece off or adding a piece. In this case, I cut some portions off, namely the wing, because I'm gonna be adding them later as royalizing transfers. So that completes all the cookies. I'm gonna reset now and show you some of the tools that went into creating these, and then we'll get started shaping some of the dough. Now for this six inch fluted round, I just used a standard cookie cutter, copper cutter. I think this came from coppergifts.com, but again, all the links to sources will be in the video description. For shaping the dome, I use a six inch cardboard to cut out the dough and then drape it over this four inch cake mold. I need a hole in it, so in this case, I'm using a pastry tip to cut the hole. When we get to some of the smaller domes, I'll just be cutting the holes with the tip of a rose nail. You could also use a skewer. For the scallop pieces, just a standard three and seven eighths inch cutter, I believe, fluted round with, I believe it's a two and a half inch cutter on the inside, but again, the dimensions will be in the video description. That'll create this nice flat shape. To create the contour shape, I cut it much the same way and then drape it over this dome. These two pieces I will show next because they're some of the more involved. 
These domes all get shaped exactly the same way as the big dome, except over different implements. For this medium sized domed, I cut the dough with this size cutter. Again, dimensions will be in the video description and draped it over the back of a tablespoon that's oven proof and can go in the oven. Use this smaller skewer to make a hole before baking and also to open it up immediately when it comes out of the oven. If it's closed at all during baking, you wanna open it back up. And then lastly, the small dome gets shaped over a teaspoon. I think this is about one inch across. This is slightly bigger across. And so therefore I use a little smaller cutter. You wanna choose a cutter that's a little bit longer and wider than the form you're draping it over so that the dough comes all the way down to the end. And if there's a little excess, you can always cut it back, but you don't want it to run too short. Or when you put these two together, you won't get a true sphere. You'll get something that's more oblate, more oval. Then for the nest, slightly bigger. I think this is a two and seven eighths inch, two and three quarters dome shaped over a silicone mold in this case, because I didn't have a metal form. Either will work and I handle them the same way. Neither gets dusted or greased before they go in the oven. And a slightly bigger cutter, of course, because it has to fit all the way around and down the sides, the dough, in order to drape it and shape it to it. And then the last cutter I used is an Ann Clark cutter, which is super cute. But as I said, I franken cookied it by lopping off this wing. So I'm gonna show in actual demonstration form this dome, this scallop piece, and the bird, because they're the most complex. But before I do, just a note about additional tools. We're gonna to be using some fondant to trim out the base of the big dome, also a textured rolling pin to create that basket weave effect on it. I'll be using some dragees, some rather big ones, five or six millimeter ones, those green beads you see around the midsection. And also in some photos, I've laid them around the base of the piece as well. So we need some dragees. We need a couple of different colors of fondant to join the pieces together in the assembly process. And then we'll need a host of royal icing to of course dip the pieces, ice the pieces and decorate them. I am working with my gingerbread dough, cut out cookie gingerbread dough. The recipe link will be in the video description. It's well formulated for 3D contoured cookie work, but any dough can be adapted and modified for such work. In fact, I get tons of questions about that, so I've created a whole nother video that's gonna address that coming in the future. So be on the lookout for that. You needn't work with gingerbread. I'm gonna start by showing you how to shape the big dome. All of the small domes will be done exactly the same way. I start by rolling the dough relatively thin, about 1 8 to 3 16 of an inch thick. I find that the thinner it's rolled, the less likely it is to crack when it goes over the contoured cake pan. You want to flour the surface pretty well because we do need to lift it off. I'm going to trace around the six inch cardboard to create the shape that we're going to drape over the dome. If you had a cutter, you could use that, but uh, a cardboard is just as useful. Again, sliding my ruler under it to make sure it's completely disengaged before I lift it. I don't want to stretch the dough too much if it's stuck to the work surface. And then just drape it over the cake pan. You want to pat it down ever so gently to remove the pleats and then trim off the excess. I like to trim about a quarter of an inch away from the edge because the dough will spread a little bit and we don't want it running into the bottom of the pan or you'll get a really fat lip on the bottom of the dome. I'm cutting a quarter inch hole in the top to receive the skewer using a pastry tip and then simply setting it on a cookie sheet and into the oven it goes. To shape the ring, we're gonna roll the dough to the same thickness, but cut it with about a four inch fluted round cutter and then cut out the inside with a two and a half inch round cutter, leaving the dough around it intact until all the pieces are cut. This way the dough is less likely to misshape. Again, you wanna flour the surface really well because this needs to lift off the mat with little distortion and we're gonna drape it over this four inch circle like so. You might want to straighten it out a little bit before it goes into the oven if it's misshaped at all, but that looks pretty good. So onto the back of the cookie sheet and into the oven it goes until lightly browned around the edges. Onto the bird. Again, this is a Franken cookie, meaning it's a unique shape created from an existing cutter and I'm creating it by cutting away a part. I'm going to roll the dough a little thicker than I do for my 3D pieces because I want the bird to look a little chubby and just cut as you usually would. Peel away the excess dough and you can of course re-roll that. And all I'm gonna do is simply chop off the lower wing because we're gonna use 
royalizing transfers as the wings, and that will otherwise be confusing if that stays on. And then into the oven that goes, I like to bake like-sized things on separate cookie sheets so the cookies bake evenly. So with the pieces all baked and cooled, we're ready to begin the outlining and flooding of the flat pieces and also the dipping of the contoured pieces. I'm not gonna show the outlining and flooding here because it's a basic technique covered in another video. I in fact also covered dipping in another video too, but since it's pretty unique, I am gonna show the dipping of the really big piece and the scallop piece, which I've not ever shown such pieces dip before. But as a reminder, all the domed pieces will be dipped with some form of color to start, and then we'll move on to decorating. So in this little segment here, I'll be dipping the big piece, the scallop piece, and then beginning to decorate the base piece of the nest, which is comprised of four pieces. The first thing is you wanna make sure that you file all the bottoms of the domes after they bake, so they, if they're coming together as a unit, they sit flush together. This piece you can see is not filed. Actually, neither of them are, so there's some big gaps. And I would simply to file them down, use a microplane tool if you're eating the project because it is food grade and go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Or if you're not gonna eat it, then sanding paper is a lot faster, but it's not a food grade material. So you do it with both sides until they meet really, really flush. And you want to do that with anything that's being joined together, as in these two medium domes. You also want to get flat bottoms on anything that isn't joined together so it sits nice and flush against whatever it's sitting on. So that's a much better fit, as you can see. I've already filed the big dome here. So that's ready to be dipped. And on the scallop piece, sometimes there's a bit of roughness around this inner ring. And I will take a different tool. This is just a, a standard file. You can also use a really small microplane and just run it around here to just kind of neaten up that edge. And then of course, once filed, you wanna dust off any crumbs before you start the dipping process. Now we're gonna move ahead and dip. So for dipping, I use icing of dipping consistency naturally. It runs rather speedily off the spoon, but it's thick enough to coat the back of a domed piece without completely running off. The key here is to plunge the piece head on and make sure, of course, the icing's deep enough to fit your piece. I could have used a little bit more icing in this bowl because my piece is actually touching the bottom of the bowl, which is gonna leave me with a big bubble in the center. But hopefully I can pop that out. You wanna do any popping immediately. If you pop too late, you can leave little dents in the dome. These big domes are rather challenging in that regard, so you have to pop pretty fast. Now, to drain it, I'm gonna set it on this plastic covered cake pan. We want it to drain so that we don't have a foot at the bottom, but you also wanna knock off any excess icing so that edge is as clean as possible once it dries. That will just minimize the amount of sanding or filing we have to do in the end. And before it completely dries, you wanna open up the hole we cut in the top to receive that skewer later. For the ring, I'm using the exact same icing of dipping consistency. Again, the consistency adjustments will be in a link in the video description. I don't need as much depth in the bowl for this piece because it's much shallower than the big dome, so this should be fine. I'm just gonna dip it head on. This process is a little messier because of that central hole, so a lot of icing tends to dump through and on your hands, but uh, have no fear. I also tend to get these big stripes or lumps along the edge, which you can see there to the front left. So I wanna give it adequate time to drain. I also missed a little area at the bottom that I'm filling in with my trussing needle. Again, set it aside on a covered container to drain, and then you wanna trace along the entire scallop to make sure you've got a nice curvy edge all the way around. You wanna do this before the icing dries, maybe a couple of times. Okay, once all the dipped pieces are dry, we're ready to put it all together. This is an example of where we're headed. The first step is going to be to secure the dome onto the base. Then we'll add the fondant band and then all the other piped details. The first step is to file down that big dome. You can use sanding paper if you're not gonna eat the project. Remember, sanding paper is not food grade, so if you are gonna eat it, you wanna use a microplane tool, which is food grade. I also like to open up the hole at the top if it's at all closed off to make sure it can receive that skewer. I'm using a round file for that. 
Once that's all done, we're ready to attach the two. I've marked the front of both the dome and the base. I always wanna make sure my best face is forward. So you'll see I'm always marking pieces and lining them up. I'm using a little brown glue here. I like to match the glue to the base color so that if any pops out, it's less likely to show. And by glue, I mean icing glue. You'll find the recipe and the consistency adjustment in the video description. Now I'm just cleaning up that glue with my trussing needle and we're ready to lay the fondant band. I'm rolling it through on the first setting, which is relatively thick because I wanna get a good impression with this textured rolling pin that I'm rolling on top. This is a PME basket weave type rolling pin. You wanna press uniformly and pretty hard to make sure you get a nice impression all the way down the strip. And then we want to cut it out about an inch wide or so. Sometimes a paring knife and dragging it is not the best option because it can stretch the pattern. So you are likely gonna be better off if you do up and down chopping motions with a bigger knife, especially on something this long and also textured because you don't wanna distort the pattern by stretching the fondant. Now we're ready to attach it. And to do that, I use a little bit of corn syrup. I don't like to use icing glue here because it can sometimes be rather lumpy and show through the fondant, but I'm only gonna put down corn syrup a bit at a time. If you put it down the entire length, the ribbon could fold back on itself and stick to itself. So you don't want that to happen. You just wanna apply it as you wrap it around. And again, you wanna make sure that seam ends in the back. All of our seams will line up at the very back. If they line up in different areas, you just have more to cover later on. Now we're ready to trim out the base of the fondant, I'm using a relatively thick royal icing and a number 25 star tip to create this shell border. And again, I'm starting in the back and closing out the seam where the fondant seam was. And that looks great. Just gonna tuck that end in a little bit, but that'll probably be an area where I'll put a flower in the end, so it doesn't matter that much. Now I'm ready to put down the scalloped ring. It's sitting a little high on the dome, so I do want to file it down a little bit more again using that round file to get off that excess icing which is preventing it from sitting snugly on top of the dome. But be careful doing this, this piece is rather fragile. Yeah, I think that looks better. Now before you stick it down, you wanna make sure it's centered front to back and side to side. So everything views symmetrically all the way around the piece. Here I'm using white royal icing glue because if I need to move it around, I won't leave a stain on the blue icing with the white icing. Once it's situated, remove the excess glue. You'll see I still have a pretty big gap there, so we're gonna close that out with a little ring of fondant as well. This time I'm gonna use eggplant fondant to tie into some colors elsewhere on the piece. Rolling it out a bit thinner this time, maybe to the number two or three setting, which is closer to a 16th of an inch than an eighth of an inch. And I'm gonna cut a big circle and then a smaller one within it to create a ring that's gonna sit inside that brown scallop piece and close off that gap to some extent. But the fondant's still really stretchy. I don't wanna put it up yet or I can distort the ring. So I'm gonna set that aside to dry a bit once I, I get it straightened out again here with the cutter. And then we'll put it on a bit later. In the meantime, we're gonna pipe some stripes down the side of the blue dome. Here I'm using icing of outlining consistency, about the same color as the fondant band. I like to bring in similar colors across the entire piece just to uh, make it look more cohesive. When piping these sections, you wanna make sure that you're always piping front on to the area you're piping. That way the line is more likely to go straight as opposed to at an angle. Once all the lines are down all the way around, again, I'm just doing a section of it, we're ready to lay some crosses in between those vertical lines, just like so. So touching down, dragging the icing over and making contact at the end to break the line. And I would complete that process, of course, all the way around. And here's what a piece of it will look like. We're gonna add some more details to that later. But first, I wanna continue by trimming out the scallop. So again, just making contact, letting the icing fall and making contact again at the top part of the scallop. And we do that, of course, all the way around. Now that fondant piece is sufficiently dry that it's still flexible, but holding its shape and is less likely to distort. So I'm ready to Paste it down again with a little bit of corn syrup. I am gonna stretch it ever so slightly to fill that gap a little bit better. And now I'm gonna put the blue dome on top again. That's my front, that little black mark. So I wanna make sure it aligns with the front of the overall piece below it for best viewing. 
again using white glue so that if I have to move it around, it's less likely to show. And just making sure my skewer goes up and down straight through all those pieces. That'll be critical when we get to the final assembly. Now I do want to trim out along the base of that blue dome. I'm going to do so with the same color fondant using a slightly different tool. This is actually a tracing wheel, which is a sewing tool. I often like to adopt tools from other disciplines and use them in baking. And this one just makes a really beautiful little edge. And we're going to have a very fine strip that's just going to finish off the bottom of that blue dome. Again, attaching it with corn syrup as we did with the large fondant band at the base. Applying the corn syrup gradually and making sure the seam is at the back and coincides with the seams across the rest of the piece. That looks great. Now I've still got a pretty big gap despite having put this fondant ring next to the brown scallop. So I'm going to fill that with dragees. They also add a pop of color, which is great. I'll probably also use them around the base in between the scallops at the very bottom once I set this all up and assemble the entire piece. Again, I like to carry common elements and colors across three-dimensional pieces to make them look more cohesive. So I'm just gluing them down with a little bit of royal icing glue. Okay, so I've got almost all the big stuff down. I've got one last green bead to go. Of course, I didn't pipe all the way around all this lattice work. Just imagine that I had. It's rather time consuming and I will show you the finished piece up here in all of its glory when we're done. But I do want to attach that last bead and then we're going to talk about the small, smaller finish work little tiny dots that close off and neaten up the lattice and also just add a little more interest. And again, I won't be doing those dots all the way around. I'm just going to show you a couple of representative types and then cut to the finished piece I did much earlier so you can see the full range of decorating that's possible on this base. For this, I do need to elevate the piece, however. So I'm going to bring in the styrofoam to do that. And then we'll move forward with my beadwork consistency icing. I'm going to lay some big orange dots first at the big seams. They're not only decorative, but they'll also help to conceal some of the starting and end points on the blue lines that were laid on top of the dome. So for the dots, I use icing of beadwork consistency naturally. It's rather loose, so it forms a nice, well-rounded bead on its own without any peaks. Next, I want to add some small pink dots around the crosses and then some larger ones along the top of the fondant. Starting first with the small ones, then I'll open up the bag a little bit to do the big ones, just by cutting back the tip a bit. As for cutting that tip, I'm cutting off just a touch, so this is maybe open 1 16th of an inch at the most, and I'll also push a little bit harder to get a big bead. The last detail will be a small purple dot in the center of the crosses. So let me just drag that piece over so you can see what a finished dome might look like in all its glory and of course you can swap up the colors and do them completely differently. I've got a completely different palette as you can see in the foreground. Okay, so we want to talk about how to decorate or not decorate as the case may be all the little domes that go between the base I just constructed and the nest inclusive of the nest. The small blue dome that we put on top of the base here is going to remain undecorated. This one's going to go up directly underneath the nest. So I'm going to set that aside for safekeeping. There will be two interior domes, middle-sized domes that are going to sit on top of this. I've got two obviously already done. So we do want to get lines on those and I'm going to show you how to do that on just one of these pieces. It's something I've done before in other videos. And the nest is just a variation of that. I did a series of lines and then dots in between them. So I'm not going to show that. I think getting the lines down is the hardest part. The dots should follow naturally in the same process, just with a looser beadwork icing. And then the top of the nest, which is this piece here, was decorated in much the way I did this little swag here. Same blue icing just around the edge and then little pink dots around the interior. So these two pieces I won't show, but I will show how to get those lines up because that can be a little bit tricky. Now the first thing you want to do again is choose your fronts, which I've done by marking them with a marker on the inside. So wherever the best facing fitted is, is generally where I mark those fronts. And then you also want to make sure they're sanded down once again. There's a nice tight fit, relatively speaking, before you start piping. And if there isn't, you can go ahead and use that sanding paper and just give them another whirl or microplaner if you're going to be eating the project. 
Okay, I'm using icing of outlining consistency, drawing down straight lines, and first marking off quadrants on the dome, then bisecting those quadrants, and then bisecting again to lay down 16 lines. Now, if I'm careful to draw straight down, as I described earlier, and to bisect evenly, and if I do that on the matching piece, I'm more or less assured that those lines, once those two hemispheres come together, are gonna to be nicely aligned. So I can do this all freehand if I just bisect evenly. Okay, so that's the basic piping process of lines. If I were doing dots, I'd just come down through the center of every other set of lines and fill them in. That's how I completed the nest, as you recall. But I'll be using these dry ones to put this together in my next video. Okay, we're ready for the bird on top, who's probably my favorite part of it because he's got all these fun little elevated royal icing transfers on him, which is why I cut off the wing in the first place so I could put a cooler wing on later. I am not gonna show you how I outlined and flooded him, but we're gonna start with something that looks like this. So he's outlined in royal blue. I left a little space here between the tail and the body, so I have an anchor point for the royal icing transfers we're gonna put in later. I haven't put his beak on yet, but we will add that last. He's been flooded with a Wedgwood blue, Merrick color color and a little bit of peach in the breast here. And we'll be adding details in the royal icing transfers, but first I wanna talk about those royal icing transfers because those are the fun, cool part. Both the wing that you see lifted here and the little tail feathers are all little transfers. And you can see I've got some individual ones already made. These are tail feathers in various sizes, ranging from about, I'd say half an inch to about three quarters of an inch, but I'll have the exact dimensions in the video description. And then I've got wings of different styles already made and dried and ready to be applied to this guy. I think I'll be using these, but I'm gonna show you the basic method of piping those and getting them off. And then lastly, we have a few little royal icing transfer dots, which we'll use at intersection points. But I'm gonna focus on just the tail feathers and the wings because those are the more complex and interesting parts of the project. And then we'll put him all together with details. Okay, starting with the tail feathers, I'm going to outline this template. The template I'm using here is actually one I use for the leaves on this project. You could also trace a small teardrop shape cutter and that would work just as well. Then we're gonna immediately flood with a lighter blue royal icing, teasing it into the end with my trussing needle. And we wanna do a few of these for each bird, three to four at least. And I'm gonna lay a little stripe down the middle with my outlining consistency and set that aside to dry. I'm piping on acetate here because it misshapes less than parchment paper, so the piece is less likely to buckle. Onto the wing, outlining again as I did the other piece, and laying a blue icing in the top and a lighter blue at the bottom. So this is gonna be a two-tone wing. Again, using my trussing needle to get into those tight spots. Back to my outlining icing, I wanna lay a few details on top first a stripe to conceal the boundary between those two colors. And I'm piping rather slowly so I don't break the line because I don't want to have to redo this. I'm going to do a couple of stripes and then knock off the excess at the end and a little swag here. I think that looks just cute. And again, you'd set that aside to dry, typically overnight, and then you can lift it off. This is where we're headed in terms of attaching the pieces and decorating the whole bird. So let me start by getting some of those details on. Again, same outlining consistency here for delineating the tail feathers. Same up here at the neck. I often start off the cookie so I get a nice clean starting point and no big blob there and then I just knock it off with my trussing needle later. Again, outlining consistency assures that the lines do not spread that much when they hit the cookie and those consistency adjustments will be found in the video description. Using outlining consistency as well for the beak and beadwork consistency for the eye. I need a looser icing for these dots as well. All the orange dots are done with beadwork consistency. That looks sweet. Now we do want that to dry before we start attaching the transfers. So I'm gonna bring in another piece that's completely dry and show you how I do that. First, I set down a wing in the back and I apply a little white royal icing glue. You could decorate this piece completely from both sides, but I'm doing this in a one-sided fashion. So I'm facing the wing forward I've left a little gap here between the tail and the body, and that was on purpose, so I could place those tail feathers, these smaller tail feather transfers, 
into that groove and I'm just nestling them in an upright position with a little bit of paper towel underneath and concealing that seam in the center with one of those royal icing dots. Here I'm using blue royal icing glue because if it peeks out, it is less likely to show against the blue trim on the tail feathers. That looks great. Again, you don't want to remove that paper towel until those tail feathers are completely dried in place. We're going to do a similar type of attachment here on the, the front wing, propping it with paper towel and attaching with royal icing glue. In that case, white icing is your best bet because if it moves, it's less likely to show. And there she is, beautiful. With that, I've completed the decorating of the bird, obviously, and also all the other nine pieces that go into the project. One thing to point out before I close is that I purposely left the designs on each individual piece relatively simple, just an assortment of lines and dots, no real fancy piping or scrolling or elaborate designs. And I did that on purpose because We've already got a lot of complicated stuff going on. We've got 10 pieces to this project. We've got multiple colors. I don't know how many, seven or eight, you can see in the video description. And to layer on additional detail in lots of different directions is bound to make this look pretty crazy. And remember, I'll also be adding flowers and vines, and those vines are gonna add some softness and curve to the project. Remember when doing 3D projects, don't go overkill on each individual piece. I find almost if the individual pieces are under-designed, the overall assembled project looks that much better. But you'll be the test of that because in my next video, I will be putting it all together. Also, as a reminder, in a future video, I will be showing how to make all the royal icing flowers, leaves, and vines. Till next video, live sweetly. Mm -hmm.